Questions or how oral questions the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Mr. Speaker, the 40 Liberal members are noting what Canadians know already. This Prime Minister is simply not worth the cost, the crime, or the corruption. But those MPs are telling us that they need the Prime Minister's permission to speak at tomorrow's caucus meeting. So he will be able to muzzle them with regards to the doubling of our debt, of inflation, of housing costs and corruption. Will he allow freedom of expression for his MPs so that they can express themselves? So, uh, the chair could not detect that this uh, question has to do with the administration of government. Uh, the right honourable prime minister. I think, Mr. Speaker, we see on voit très. We see very clearly once again that the leader of the opposition is should concern himself with his priorities. He's not, he doesn't care about Canadians' priorities. We're delivering for Canadians for dental care, for pharmacare, for $10 a day daycare. The Conservative leader offers only cuts and austerity and political play. What we are going to do on this side of the House is work for Canadians and their well-being. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker. It's the Prime Minister who is distracted, distracting himself with political games because his own MPs, about 40 of them, have noted that he is simply not worth the cost, the crime, or the corruption. They have lost their trust in this uh, Prime Minister. It's strange that the Bloc Québécois keeps voting for confidence in the government when the own government's members seem to no longer want to do so. Mem members should be able to express themselves freely. Will the Prime Minister stop muzzling them so that they can express themselves to say finally that the Prime Minister is not worth the cost or the crime? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Once again, Mr. Speaker, we see the point up to which the Leader of the Opposition is only working for his own partisan politics. He's not working for the well-being of Canadians. We are here to invest in pharmacare, for example, that will deliver insulin for free to those who need it, that will deliver contraception for women from coast to coast to coast. And the Conservative leader just wants to talk about politics. He wants to talk about the cuts that he will make in programs that Canadians need. We will be here for Canadians. Then I have Chef. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, we now learn there are about 40 Liberal MPs that believe that this NDP Liberal Prime Minister is not worth the cost, crime and corruption. But there's this strange rule in the Liberal caucus that you need to have permission from the Prime Minister to speak at the microphone. So a Liberal MP wanted to get up and say quadrupling the carbon tax is a bad idea or doubling housing costs is making people homeless. They can't do it. Will the Prime Minister lift the gag so his Liberal MPs can say to his face that he's not worth the crime, the cost and the corruption? Once again in English, uh, none of these questions have to deal with the administration of government, but I see the... I, I see the... Order... I see that the Prime Minister is rising to his feet, the Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, it seems that the Conservative leader is conf confusing rules of the apply within his Conservative yeah. caucus uh, to rules that we have in the Liberal Party. Yeah. So the reality is, Mr. Speaker, we see at which point the Conservative leader is simply focused on playing politics and gaining power. Uh, that's why uh, he wants to talk about things uh, that are uh, not having to do with delivering for Canadians. He doesn't want to talk about the fact that close to a million Canadians uh, will be receiving dental care because of our Canadian dental program that he says doesn't even exist and that he's voted against every step of the way. Yeah. 
I ask the Honourable Member from uh, Battle River Crowfoot uh, to please uh, not, take, not take the microphone when, uh, when the Speaker is up on his feet or when uh, other speakers who have been recognized by the Speaker is taking the floor. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, I'm sorry to have to bring up this terrible rule. It's just that Liberal backbench MPs are coming and talking to all of yeah. us <laughs> to say that they're not allowed to speak to him. And they're wondering if I could perhaps pose some questions on their behalf. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I guess they can't get anywhere with the current Prime Minister, so they'd rather talk to the future common sense Conservative. Yeah. Yeah. Silencing his own MPs, will he let them get up to the mic tomorrow to tell him that he's not worth the cost, crime, and corruption? The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the reality is he can't administer the government because he's too busy fighting for his job after nine years, even if his MPs know it. He broke immigration, he doubled the debt, doubled housing costs, doubled crime, doubled the cost of living in a home. He wants to quadruple the carbon tax that's already forced two million people to a food bank, one in four kids to hunger, 25 percent of Canadians to poverty, Canadian food prices up 36 percent faster than in the state. Stats can says we have the biggest gap between rich and poor in our recorded history. His MPs know that he's broke the country. Will he call a carbon tax election so we can fix it? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition, like all, all of us in this House, know that Canadians are facing challenging times. His solution, however, uh, is to offer them cuts, is to offer them no programs that they can rely on, and to vote against things like dental care and pharmacare and investments in a green economy that is going to create jobs and careers long into the future. He wants to harm Canadians where we're focusing on delivering for them. He wants cuts to programs and services while we're busy investing in Canadians and their futures. That's the choice Canadians get to make. The Honourable Member for Belleau Chambly. Mr. Speaker, time is moving on. Four million retirees in Canada, one million retirees in Quebec are waiting for an improvement of their purchasing power in a real way, and not through slogans. Thousands of supply-managed farmers and producers are waiting for their system to be protected. Will the Prime Minister seize the opportunity to do something useful and improve the lives of four million retirees, one million retirees in Quebec, and tens of thousands of farmers and producers? The Right Honourable Prime Minister like my honourable colleague knows full well, we will always defend supply management. We will always protect our farmers and producers from coast to coast to coast. With regards to seniors, he says that he wants to act. Well, we've acted. When we reduced retirement from 67, as the Conservatives wanted, to 65, unfortunately, the bloc voted against. We also acted when we delivered an increase in 10% in the Guaranteed Income Supplement, the Bloc voted against. There's a dental care program that delivered for close to one million Canadians they voted against. The Honourable Member for Bailey Chambly. The Prime Minister is manipulating the facts, but acting is something he'll have to do in a few days. In a paralysed parliament like this one, with a paralysed government like this one, we have made a proposal that will help people. A proposal that could stabilize Parliament for another few weeks. He'd need it. Will he allow his party to be eaten from within and without, or will he change things for the better for millions of people? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. I've said many times, Mr. Speaker, I completely agree with the desire to be here for seniors who need our help, and that is the reason for which our government has enacted a number of measures in the past years to invest in seniors, to be here for our seniors, 
and we are open to working with people in this House in order to deliver even more for seniors. The Honourable Member for Rosemont la Petite Patrie. Mr. Speaker, poverty and insecurity are affecting more and more people. According to one study, every month 40% of Quebecers are a mere $200 away from bankruptcy. $200, Mr. Speaker. The situation is so serious that the expression tightening our belts is becoming too real. 20% of people are eating less just to save a bit of money. It makes no sense. It's a result of the Liberals' weakness in forcing CEOs of big grocery stores to do the right thing. When will the Liberals stand up, grow a spine, and force these companies to control the prices of essential foods? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, the NDP knows full well that we have enacted measures to improve competitivity between uh, groceries. We have delivered direct aid to families who needed it, and we're also delivering a program for food in schools that is saving hundreds for families from coast to coast to coast. We will continue to be here to support Canadians. We will continue to be here to invest in programs that will help Canadians, whilst the Conservatives are just threatening austerity and cuts. The Honourable Member from Nunavut. Last week, First Nations leaders respected the First Nations Caring Society by voting to guarantee all First Nations children will be protected from Canada's discrimination in child and family services. The Liberals had offered a weak funding plan with an expiry date. This discrimination must stop now and forever. Will the Prime Minister finally respect the Human Rights Tribunal, stop discriminating against First Nations children? and offer First Nations an agreement that upholds their rights. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, reconciliation means walking as true partners to Indigenous peoples, and we, of course, will continue to be there uh, to invest in supports for Indigenous peoples. It means we will continue to work with them in the ways that make sense. I will highlight uh, that the Chiefs of Ontario and the Anishinaabe uh, Aski Nation uh, are continuing to look for ways uh, to move forward with the government to support kids who have been affected in care. We will continue to be there to work in partnership with Indigenous leadership and communities to deliver the supports so deeply needed by so many young people. That's great. great. The Honourable Member from Calgary Forest Lawn. After nine years of the Silver NDP government, taxes up, costs up, crimes up, times up. The Parliamentary Budgeting Officer confirmed what Canadians already know. This incompetent finance minister can't do math. She's going to blow through her own deficit this year by $7 billion. Wow. That's higher taxes and lower standards of living. One in four Canadians are already skipping meals, and this Liberal made misery is only going to get worse. Why not call a carbon tax election now so Conservatives can fix the budget? Yeah. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister and Minister Finance. Mr. Speaker, I am so glad to hear the Conservatives talk about the PBO because just a few weeks ago, the PBO did a report on the sustainability of the federal finances. And I'm going to quote what the PBO said, quote, current fiscal policy at the federal level is sustainable over the long term. In fact, according to the PBO, the federal government could even, quote, permanently increase spending by 1.5 percent of GDP. The only fiscal threat to Canada is Conservatives, who would cut health care, child care, national school fees. The Honourable Member from Calgary Forest Salon. That PhD in Wackonomics has no clue. This incompetent finance minister, not knowing how to do math, Colleagues, try to encourage as much uh, freedom as possible in terms of uh, in terms of the way people express themselves here. I'm going to ask uh, honourable members 
I'm going to ask honourable members uh, to, as much as possible, refrain uh, from using language which is directed at a particular member and is considered uh, uh, insulting to those members. So I'm going to uh, uh, encourage all members, and I've spoken about this in a previous ruling, I'm going to ask the honourable member uh, from Calgary Forest Lawn uh, to, uh, to start his question again, but to rephrase his question so that he doesn't use that kind of language. That sounds like liberal economics, and this incompetent finance minister not knowing how to do math ensured 50% of Canadians can't afford basic necessities like food. She'll give cushy contracts to rich liberal insiders while telling the 2 million Canadians she sent into a food bank they can solve their liberal-made misery by cancelling their Disney+. Plus. She knows higher deficits lead to higher taxes and lower standards of living. She just doesn't care. Why not call a carbon tax election now so Canadians can fire these economic uh, arsonists? I'm going to come back to members on this matter, but I'm going to encourage all members. I'm going to encourage all members to please keep their counsel when they're not recognized by the chair. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, thank you for your remonstrations, but I have to tell you, speaking for myself, puerile playground insults from the maple syrup manga. Don't bother me. Yes. 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 As, as I mentioned, precisely the reason why we should be very mindful of our language, because the things will be said on all sides which is going to be disturbing to the, to the order of the House. I'm going to come back to this matter, and I'm going to uh, ask the Deputy Prime Minister to start her question again without uh, using those words. The Honourable, uh, the Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I can handle it. But what makes me really mad, what I can't handle, is hearing croco seeing crocodile tears from these Conservatives. The only time they care to notice vulnerable Canadians is for a partisan photo app. And we know they don't care because they are opposed to a national school food program that is feeding 400,000 Canadian kids. They're opposed to dental care that is ha helping a million. We care about Canadians. They just care about themselves. The Honourable Member from Battleford, Lloyd Minster. Mr. Speaker, after nine years of this NDP Liberal government, taxes are up, costs up, crimes up, and you know what? Time is up. This costly NDP Liberal coalition has doubled the cost of housing, and the majority of Canadians are unable to keep up with their grocery needs. Canadians have had enough, but the NDP Liberal coalition only wants to drive up costs by quadrupling their carbon tax. Will the Prime Minister Finally, call a carbon tax election so Conservatives can offer Canadians some relief. Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Housing, Infrastructure and Communities. Mr. Speaker, under the Conservative leader, slogans are up, rhymes are up, and parroting talking points so you get a shiny gold star and caucus <laughs> seems to be up. I cannot imagine yeah. diminishing myself when I have the opportunity to represent my community in the House to cheapen the arguments that we can put forward on the floor of the House of Commons. If they care about helping people, why don't they actually support the policies that help build homes for people who can't afford them? Why don't they actually help advance policies that let families put food on the table, whether that is childcare, a middle-class tax cut, or the Canada Child Benefit? Every time we put measures forward to help Canadians, they vote against it and stand up with this nonsense. Yay!
The Honourable Member from Battleford, Lloyd Minster. Well, Mr. Speaker, I can tell you the Canadians that are lined up at food banks aren't buying their pathetic rhetoric. The Parliamentary Budget Officer has already confirmed once again that the carbon tax is costing Canadians more than they receive in rebates. And for families in Saskatchewan, the quadrupled carbon tax is $2,000. Will the Prime Minister finally, finally, finally give Canadians the carbon tax election that they so desperately need? Yeah. The Honourable Minister for Natural Resources and Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let me provide a few facts to the Honourable Member. Fact. The PBO confirmed that the vast majority of Canadians get more money back than they pay. Fact. Over 300 economists say carbon pricing is the best way to reduce emissions that is best for the economy. Fact. Alberta Premier Daniel Smith said her family gets more money back with the carbon rebate. Fact. Saskatchewan Premier Scott Bowe said he looked at all alternatives to the carbon price and they were all too expensive. We are reducing uh, uh, emissions while we are addressing affordability. On Okay, so get ready to jump right into the middle of Canadian politics. Because um, <laughs> we're diving into a parliamentary session that got a little fiery. Okay. We've got the official records. Right. And let me tell you, it's way more dramatic than you might think. Really? It's like an episode of House of Cars, but like in real life. Okay. And I'm intrigued. We're going to be right there. Like we're on the floor of the House of Commons. Wow. We're going to break it all down. Like the maneuvering, the attacks, the moments when even the speaker has to like step in yeah so are you ready to make sense of this political let's do it go down i think there's always more than meets the eye right always like this isn't just about them disagreeing it's like a master class in like how to do political strategy totally we're gonna see how each side is using language and statistics and even like emotions mm -hmm. to get what they want yeah so let's just jump right into it yeah the debate that we're looking at today starts with gun violence in canada of course, a big issue. Huge issue. And right away, you see this like really stark divide between the liberals and the conservatives. Okay. How to deal with this. Right. The liberals, as you might expect, they're all about stricter gun control. Okay. The prime minister secretary actually said, and I quote, we need to get these assault weapons off our streets. We need stricter background checks. We need to keep our community safe. Strong words. Very strong. And... The conservatives. So the conservatives, they're pushing back just as hard. What are they saying? They're basically saying the liberals have no idea what they're talking about. Okay. The member from Kildon and St. Paul, mm -hmm. he said that the liberals' policies just flat out aren't working. Okay. He said, quote, the reality is their current laws are not working. Criminals don't follow laws. Oh. Focusing on legal gun owners isn't going to stop the violence. So it's like they're talking about the same problem, totally. but they've got totally different solutions. Completely different. Like, it's like they're talking to totally different people. Yeah, and that's often what it feels like, right? It does. Two different realities. And this is where it gets even more interesting because it really becomes this blame game. Oh, boy. Each party is pointing the finger at the other one saying, you know, you're the reason that gun violence is getting worse. Right. And this is where it gets really juicy. Okay. The liberals bring up these budget cuts. To what? To the CBSA. CBSA. That's the Canada Border Services Agency, just for everyone. Okay. And they're saying that those cuts are the reason that it's easier for these illegal guns to just, like, walk across the border. I see. And, of course, the conservatives. Yeah. They're not just going to take that. No way. They fire back and they say, no, 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 look at the crime rates since the liberals got in. Okay. They're like, look at these statistics. You know, shootings are up. Homicides are up. Interesting. And they're basically saying, this is what happens when you take away the rights of people who actually obey the law. Oh, so they're really framing it as a rights issue. Exactly. Okay. It's all about controlling how people see the issue, right? Neither side wants to take the blame. Right. So they're pointing fingers everywhere else. Classic. But it wasn't just about guns. Okay. This session touched on other really hot button issues too. Like what? Like health care. Okay. There's this new Medicare policy that's guaranteeing access to contraceptives. And that's causing some wave. You bet. It's like they really wanted to drive that point home. Yeah. They even brought in, like, outside voices to back them up. Oh, really? Yeah, it was interesting. <laughs> so the conservative member from Kilden and St. Paul, right. 
he actually quoted the Toronto Police Association. Interesting. He said, okay. and I quote, the prime minister's words are not only out of touch, but they're downright offensive to the officers who are risking their lives every day. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So they're really trying to bring the police into it. Oh, totally. Like saying that they're on their side. Exactly. And, you know, that really plays into people's fears mm -hmm. about safety and security. For sure. It's like they're trying to make the liberals look like yeah. they're completely disconnected from what's actually happening. Totally. And then right after that, mm -hmm. did they hit us with the numbers? Oh, yeah. Here come the statistics. Okay. So like, bam. 45% increase in shootings since the liberals took over. Okay. 62% increase in gun homicides. Wow. And it's like... Yeah, you can't really argue with numbers, right? It's hard. Like they sound very official. They do. Yeah. But it's interesting because yeah. numbers can be used in so many different ways. Oh, yeah. Right? You can make them tell whatever story you want. Totally. It's all about how you frame them. Exactly. Without the full context. Yeah. Like, who knows what those numbers really mean? Right, right. But it doesn't really matter, does it? Not really. Because they create this sense of urgency. Totally. This like fear. Well, you're listening and they're thinking, oh my gosh, something's got to be done. Exactly. Exactly. And the conservatives, they kept this going. They kept bringing up illegal guns. Okay. They said something like 85% of the guns that the police are taking off the streets, mm. they can be traced back to the U.S. Oh, wow. Okay, so what they're doing there is they're shifting the focus exactly. from inside Canada to outside Canada. It's brilliant. Right. Like, it's not our problem. It's their problem. And it's like, hello, border security. Exactly. Remember that whole thing about the CBSA? Oh, yeah. Like, this is their thing, right? They are laser focused on that. They're trying to say the liberals have really messed up on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And on the other side of this, yeah. the liberals, I felt like they kind of just yeah. stuck to their talking points. About the gun lobby? About the gun lobby. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They didn't really engage... What the conservatives were saying? With the actual, like... With the arguments. Arguments, yeah. It, and it's like they weren't really listening. It felt like they were more interested in, like, saying their lines yeah. than actually yeah. having a conversation. Which doesn't really work, does it? No, especially in politics. People can see right through that. Totally. And it yeah. makes you wonder, like, yeah. are they even listening to the people they're supposed to be representing? Right. Because... It's not just what you say, right? It's not. Man. It's like the whole vibe. Oh, totally. The tone, the way you say it. The emotion behind it. People yeah. pick up on all of that. And there was this one moment. Okay, tell me. It was during this whole debate about the guns. Mm -hmm. It got so heated. Oh, no. That the Speaker of the House wow. had to actually step in. No way. Because the opposition was heckling so much. Really? That the Liberal Parliamentary Secretary mm -hmm. could barely be heard. Wow. It was crazy. Okay, so what happened? The speaker had to, like, tell everyone to calm down. Oh, my gosh. And she even had to ask the parliamentary secretary to repeat herself. No way. Because it was so loud. It sounds intense. It was wild. Mm -hmm. And it really makes you realize. What's that? That these aren't just, like, yeah. polite disagreements. Right. Like, these people have strong beliefs. They care about this stuff. They care deeply. Yeah. And when it's important like that. Mm-hmm. Sometimes those emotions come out. And sometimes those emotions aren't pretty. Exactly. But we can't forget about the scandal. Oh, right. That was brewing in the background. The Arrive Can. The Arrive Can scandal. Yeah. Because the conservatives. Okay. They were not going to let that one go. Right. They kept bringing it up. Like as an example. Like constantly. <laughs> they were like, this is what we're talking about when we say liberal corruption. Okay. They're really going there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And they weren't just like throwing out these vague ideas either. Okay. They had all the details. Right. Like they kept bringing up those contracts. Right. Those GC Strategies contracts. <laughs> like $100 million. Mm -hmm. And $20 million of that was just for the app. Just for ArriveCan. Just for ArriveCan. Yeah. It's like they were trying to make everyone mad. Yeah, those numbers definitely make you think. Like, a hundred million dollars. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. And, you know, people are already kind of skeptical. Yeah. About how the government spends their money. They're sure. So when they hear stuff like that. They're like, see, I told you so. Exactly. Yeah. That's like the conservatives are trying to say, look. Yeah. The liberals don't care about you. Yeah. They're just in it for themselves and their friends. They're just lining their own pockets. Exactly. And that is a really powerful message. It is. It makes people angry. It does. So the question is, yeah. what did the liberals do about it? Right. How did they respond to all of this? Yeah, good question. Well, it was almost like... Like what? 
they didn't want to talk about it. Really? Like they didn't really address the Arrive Can stuff directly. Interesting. So what did they say? They kept saying things like, Give me the rundown. Oh, we're committed to being transparent. Okay. And accountable. Right. And anyone who broke the rules should be held accountable. Yeah, but they're not really saying anything specific, yeah. are they? No, not really. It's very vague. It was very like... Like they're trying to stay above it all? Yes. Like they're too good for this? Exactly, but it makes you wonder, like, yeah. are they just trying to hide something? Right, like maybe they don't want to dig too deep. Maybe, and sometimes saying nothing yeah. speaks volumes. It really does. It's like they could have gone on the attack. How so? They could have tried to blame the conservatives. Oh, you mean like, what about when you guys did this? Exactly. Interesting. It's risky. It is. Things could have gotten even more heated. For sure. But it could have worked. Sometimes you have to fight fire with fire. Exactly. Yeah. Or they could have just like yeah. changed the subject completely. Like what about? Talk about something else they did. Okay. Like CER. Right, right. Remember that? Like they helped a lot of people with that. They did. Yeah. So it's like. Like maybe they were trying to just remind everyone yep. that they did some good things too. Exactly. Because at the end of the day, yeah. this is all about influencing people. Totally. How they think, how they feel. Right. Like it's all about winning hearts and minds. Exactly. And we've seen how they do it. We have. The words they use, the numbers they throw out there. The way they frame the issues. The way they try to make each other look bad. It's a game. It is a game. And we're all players in a way. We are, whether we like it or not. Because these debates, yeah. they really do affect our lives. They affect everything. Healthcare, the economy, the environment. Gun control. It's all connected. So the next time you're listening to the news mm, yeah. and you hear some politician yeah. going off on one. Right. Take a second. And think about what we talked about today. Exactly. Like, what are they really trying to do here? What are they not telling you? What's their angle? Exactly. Because being informed. It's not just about knowing the facts. It's about seeing through the BS. It's about understanding the game. And knowing that we all have a part to play in making sure our government actually represents us. Well said. That's all we've got for you today. But keep those questions coming because the deep dive never ends.